In this chapter, I'm going to introduce you to the result sets, which can be also called R sets in Sophistic. I will simply close back the linear analysis text input, and I have already created a new interactive result viewer file. At the moment, it's not relevant how I created it. Uh, we will learn together how to do that, and you will also find it in the model file that I'm going to provide you at the end of the course. An interactive result viewer file needs to be run and after with the right mouse click you can go and have a look at its report. So before we go into the definition of the result sets I would like to make an overview of the spring elements that we had created together in our model. I will try to simultaneously present the super system scheme on the screen. The spring elements starting with number one were defined for the springs of the peer, whereas the springs starting with number two were defined for the superstructure springs. In the superstructure springs we can find the numbers starting from 101 to 112. These were defined for the spring elements in the first support plane. The spring elements from number 201 till 212 were defined for the springs in the second support plane. And finally the springs starting with number 301 till 312 were defined for the spring elements in the third supporting plane. Now we may overview the orientation and the spring constants of the individual springs. For example, the spring 200,101 is a spring defined on the left side at the first support plane. The direction of this spring is in the global x direction and the stiffness of the spring is 1, so a very small value. This is OK because it means that this support can move in the global x direction. The spring element number 200,102 was a spring element defined at this location in the negative y direction, so in this direction, with a quite high stiffness value, which is OK again, because in this way we didn't want this uh, support to move. Finally, the spring 200,103 was defined in the global Z direction with a quite high stiffness value. So it means that this spring in the global Z direction, which is perpendicular to the screen, is quite stiff and this is what we wanted. The torsion springs that were created for this uh, left support in the first supporting plane are all set to a very small number. 1 and 1 and 1 can be seen for the torsional stiffness of the spring in the global x, global y and the global z direction. This means that there are basically no rotational spring established at this support. If we look at the translational springs uh, in the first support line on the right side, which was defined with spring number 200,107, 8 and 9, we will find very small stiffness values in the global x, the global y direction, and we can see only in the global z direction a very high stiffness. If we compare it with our sketch, this is what we wanted. This support can move in the global x and global y direction, but it is supported in the global z direction, perpendicular to the screen. Again, the rotational springs of this support in the global x, global y and global z direction are set to a very weak value. So basically, at this support, there is no rotational spring defined. Or we should say they are defined, but with a very, very small stiffness. I'm not going to go through all the spring elements definition. You can do it on your own later on. Maybe one more thing that is important to mention. 
that we can only find rotational springs with quite high stiffness at the bottom support of the pier because we assume that this support condition should be considered as fixed and that's why we set these values to a very high number. As now we have an overview about the springs and their numbers, we can now dive into the definition of the result sets in the next chapter. In this chapter I'd like to explain what a result set is and what special functionalities it has. Maybe the best if I try to elaborate it on a sketch. I have created a sketch which shows you a single span beam element. It is already discretized, so on the sketch we can see the end and the beginning of all finite elements. Let's assume that we would like to get the maximum MY bending moment at this cross section. In other words, we would like to make a superposition on this uh, structural element and we would like to get the most extreme value for an internal force. We can undertake this approach by using module maxima and it is done automatically for us and the result will be stored in a load case 2151 for example. Since it is a finite beam element, the software will know what are the corresponding internal forces. When I'm saying corresponding, I mean the internal forces that are concomitant, or maybe with in other words, contemporary internal forces within the beam elements. The most extreme value can be extracted and be visualized presented in wind graph or can be printed out in the report. But this is also true for the concomitant internal forces. This procedure is necessary for us to be able to design a beam element. But what about our springs? Or I should have asked, what about our bearings? We modeled them as spring elements. If you remember, the modeling approach was the following. We defined two structural points and in between those structural points we created six springs, three springs against translation and other three springs elements against rotation. However, these springs elements are discrete finite elements. If we obtain a spring force in one of the springs, we still don't know what is the corresponding force in the other five spring elements. Therefore, in Sophistic, a special feature called result sets were developed. With the help of the result sets, or one can say R sets, we can obtain or extract the corresponding five spring forces in the spring elements. And we will be able to design the bearings as a whole entity or a full structure. Since the complexity of the result sets, it is not possible to create such an entity graphically, we must use the text input in the Teddy environment to be able to create and set up the result sets properly. You can consider a result set or an R set as a special finite element, which was developed and now available for you to be able to obtain the results from finite elements, which are not necessarily forming a unique finite element, like I explained for the springs. Since an R set can be considered as a special kind of finite element, you need to specify it or create it before you extract the results from your model. This means that after exporting the model from SophiePlus to the database, you need to undertake the definition of the R sets with the help of text input in SSD in module SophieMesh A. Let me show you how to do that. We just need to go back to SSD, open the current project and insert a text task. If your model file is not yet opened, you can find it in the desktop ptc underscore bridge and you need to open from this folder the ptc underscore bridge dot sophistic file. In this chapter, I would like to show you how to create the result sets in your model. The model file I'm working on 
is from the desktop ptc underscore bridge ptc underscore bridge dot file. After having exported the model from Sophieplus to SSD, we simply need to insert a new text task. We can do it in the following way. I will select the Springs Overview Graphical task. With the right mouse click, I will choose the Insert New Task from the drop-down list. And in the Insert Task window, I will select the very first entry at the General chapter, which is the Text Editor task, and I will click on the OK button. And the new text task has been inserted. I will quickly rename it by hitting the F2 button on my keyboard. And the new name could be RSET for Springs. If you double click on this inserted text task, an empty Teddy environment will be open for you. Now I will enter the necessary input for the definition of the R sets. Now you have two choices. Basically, you can stop the video when I entered the text and retype what you can see on the screen. Or you can open the corresponding model file that is provided to this chapter and follow along the input in that model. Anyway, I'm going to insert the input now and we can discuss it. So now I have inserted the necessary text input and now I'm going to explain it to you line by line. The definition starts with defining the module name in the command line plus prog and sophimache. This means we are working in module sophimache. With the help of this module, we can create directly finite elements. So compared to module sophimache C, where you are working with structural elements, like for example in Sophie Plus, in this module, in Sophie Mesh A module, we are working directly with finite elements. And as I mentioned in my introduction, the result sets are a special kind of finite elements. In the headline, we are just adding a heading to the report browser output of this particular input. In the next command line with sysrest, which refers to system restart, we restart the system definition, which was ended at the export of the model from Sophieplus to SSD. And with this particular command line, it is possible to add new elements to the system without deleting the already existing one. Normally, when you start an input with, within module Sophiemesh A, the database will be deleted and every element is cleared up. Of course, we now wanted to avoid this and that's why we entered the syst rest command line to keep the elements in the system. Similarly, if we add the control rest to command, the loads that had been defined in the system will be kept. Again, the reason behind is that at every run of module Sophiemesh A, the loads will be also deleted from the database. If we want to avoid this, we need to maintain or keep the loading with the help of control rest 2 command. In the next command line, with the help of command rset del, we are deleting the already existing R sets in the system if there is any. Of course, at the beginning, we do not have any result sets defined in our model, but try to imagine the case that you already finished, for example, the creation of the first result set, run this module, and then you define the second result set in your model. To store it in the database, you need to rerun this module again. And if you rerun the model, there is an already defined and created result set in it. So you are going to get a warning message from the program reminding you that there is an already existing result set in the model. Therefore, it is a much clearer procedure if you clear the result set in the model at every run of this module. And in the forthcoming command lines, you are defining the R sets. The definition in this case starts with the declaration of a so-called text block. As you may remember from the previous chapter, with the help of hash defined command, we can define a text parameter or a text variable. The syntax for that was 
hash define, then the variable name equals text. If you do not apply the syntax hash define variable name equals text, but instead after the hash define variable name you add command lines and then you end the definition with hash and def, then you just created a text block. The advantage of creating and using text blocks is the following. If you have multiple definitions for the same thing, then you can use this text block and insert its content many times in your command lines. As you can see in this input, for example, we are going to create many R sets at support axis 1, axis 2, axis 3. And the definition is always very, very similar or actually exactly the same. In this case, the usage of text blocks makes your work very, very effective. If it is difficult to understand what a text block is, maybe I can represent it to you or show to you for better understanding. I will simply copy the content of the definition of the text block and I will insert below the first command line of the first R set. In this case, of course, we do not need to apply the hash include R set command. So we do not need to include the text block and hence we can comment this command line out. Now let's go through the definition of the first R set, command line by command line together. First, I am defining a variable with the let command, let the variable start be equal with 200,000 and 101. As you can see, I will use this variable in the definition of the result sets. Then in the next line, I'm going to add an ID to the result set. If we call up for the online help by clicking on the R set command and pushing the F1 button, the online help will be open for me. Here we can see the structure of the command. So first an identifier needs to be given to the result set in a separate line. Therefore, the first command line is R set ID S 10 L and then title spring support axis one left. An ID first always needs to be entered. Try to consider it as a beam element number. So if we have another type of finite element, for example, a beam element, it also must have an identification in this case, for a beam element, it is a number. For a result set, it could be a string variable. The ID must always start with a letter. And it could be maximum four characters long. Then you may want to add a title to your result set. In the next command line, we need to repeat the command R set. But in this case, at the item ID, we can add a specification for the internal force that we would like to extract from the finite element. What does it mean? It means that we would like to extract the corresponding internal forces of a finite element and put together into one result set. In our example file, we would like to extract the corresponding spring forces and put together them into one result set. That's why the identification could be useful if we use the shortening of the internal forces in the finite elements. Since we are talking about spring elements, the corresponding internal forces will be a spring force or will be a spring moment, will be a spring displacement, or will be a spring rotation. If you could remember, we have defined six spring elements in our model at every bearing, three translational springs in the three main global directions, and three rotational springs that can rotate 
about the three main global axes. Hence, we are going to add the name for the result set as px, py, pz, vx, vy, vz. Then, at the set item of the same rset command, you need to define the result type, the primary type of the results. You can see from the online help what availabilities we have. We can extract the results of the finite element, nodes, beams, truss elements, cable elements, spring elements, the results of shell elements at the middle point of the shell, the results of the shell elements at their nodes, and finally the results of volumetric elements, or we can call them brick elements as well. In our example file, we need to extract the results of the springs. And the available spring results are the following. P stands for the spring force in the main direction of the spring. PT is the spring's force in the transverse direction. Since the spring has a direction vector, the perpendicular plane to this vector will be the plane that the transverse spring force is acting. Hence, PTX is the transfer spring force component in the global x direction. PTY is the transfer spring force component in the global y direction and PTZ in the global z direction. You can also extract the spring moment of the spring element and the corresponding phi value. The letter V stands for the German name Verschiebung, which means displacement. So basically you have the possibility to extract the displacement in the spring direction. With VT you can extract the displacements in the transverse direction. VTX is the transverse displacement component in global x direction. VTY is the transverse displacement component in y direction. And VTZ in the global z direction. Since we had set up one spring in every global directions, we just only need to extract the spring forces and the spring rotations and the spring displacement to be able to undertake a full design of the bearings. So now with the item P, we have defined that we would like to extract the spring force from a spring element and then we need to define the number of the spring element. And this is the reason why we were so accurate at the numbering of the spring elements to be able to refer them very easily now in the definition of the result sets. Because now we can just simply use a new variable, the start variable, which number starts at 200,101. And we are going to use this variable many times, adding to 0, 1, or 2 to it, respectively. So basically, this command line means that we would like to create an R set with the ID PX, which is going to be an extraction from the springs. Namely, we are going to extract the spring force from the spring element 200,101 and we are going to give a title to this result set as PX. The identification and the title should be very similar like you imagine a beam and you would like to extract its internal forces then you would add here N for the normal force, VY for the shear force in the Y direction, VZ for the shear force in the z direction, and so on and so, and so forth. In the next three lines of the R set definition, we are going to extract the displacements of the very same spring elements. Finally, in the last three lines of the R set definition, we are going to extract the rotation of the spring elements 
but in this case we are going to add 3, 4, 5 to the starting number because we had defined the rotational springs starting from 200,104, 5 and 6. And now we have finished with the definition of the result set at support 10 on the left. And now we have finished with the definition of the result set at support axis 10 on the left. Actually, my input is not consistent because I'm talking about support axis 1, support axis 1, but here the number ref reflects to support axis 10, so I'm just going to delete it, and it's going to be finally support axis 1 on the left. And now I need to continue with the definition at support axis 1 on the right. However, most of my definition will be the same, namely from this line until this line, every input is exactly the same. So it works, copy this content into a string variable, into a text block, which is going to be the R set text block. So basically I just copied over all of my input lines between a define R set and an ndef command line added the name R set to it, and then you can use it many times. Let me show it to you how it works in this case. I'm going to simply delete the command lines after the definition of the ID of the result set, and I will reactivate the hash include command line by deleting the comment sign, the dollar sign, from the beginning of the command line. You can see it also from the online help. I'm going to close back the online help and explain once more. So basically what happens is that the text block that we had generated here between the hash defined and hash and def going to be included in the input at the definition of the R sets. First at the support axis on the left then at the first support axis on the right. Please notice that the only difference in the definition of the result set at the first support axis on the left or on the right is that the starting number or the value of the variable start is at 200,101 on the left side whereas 200,107 on the right side. These numbers are corresponding to the spring numbers that had been generated in the model. The definition of the other R sets at axis 2 and axis 3 is exactly the same. The only changing parameter is the starting number of the variable start. What we need to pay attention to as a separate case is the definition of the result set at the peer foot. The methodology is exactly the same. First, I'm defining a new text block with the name of rset underscore pf. Since at the peer foot we have defined a rigid support condition, we are interested also extracting the moments of the spring elements. Therefore, the definition of this text block contains six lines only, first three lines about the extraction of the spring force in the global directions, and the second three line is about the extraction of the moment in the spring elements about the global directions. After having entered the rset underscore pf text block, we just need to add a new variable with the help of command let and the starting number or the value of this variable will be 100,201. Then we need to set up the result set with a new ID, which is going to be peer foot at axis 20, which should be exactly 2. So peer foot at axis 2. And the title of this result set could be peer foot at support axis 2. 
then we just need to include the text block that we had created. Now we finished with the text input of the result set. To add this information to the database and to create the real result set, we need to run this module. You can run the module if you select it, a right mouse click on the module name, and then select the calculate R sets for springs from the drop down list. If you do so, the protocol of the analysis will appear. And what we can see is that module SOFIMESH A with the heading create result set was run. And without any error and without any warning, it was calculated. Now we can be sure that the result set information has been added to the database. That concludes this chapter and I'm going to continue with the definition or the combination of the temperature loads in the next chapter. In this chapter, I'm going to show you how to superimpose the effects of the single temperature load cases. I'm working on the model called PTC underscore bridge.sophistic file, which can be found on the desktop in the subfolder PTC underscore bridge. However, this model file can also be found in the model file folder of this chapter. Before we dive into the definition of the temperature loads, Let's have a look at chapter 6.1.5 in Eurocode 1991.1.5. It's dealing with the simultaneity of uniform and temperature difference components. And it states that it is necessary to take into account both the temperature difference and the uniform temperature change of the structure. And it is also states that this should be interpreted as a load combination. And this is exactly what we are going to do. We are going to combine the load cases to create the combinations. We are going to use the factors omega n and omega m. Omega n is the constant for the uniform temperature change. Omega m is the constant for the linear temperature difference. And you can see the two equations here. You need to take the linear temperature difference, heat or cool, and you need to add the omega n factorized positive or negative uniform temperature change, or you need to take the positive or negative uniform temperature change and add the linear temperature change multiplied with omega m factor. So let's create now the corresponding input in SSD. The procedure will be exactly the same. I will insert a new text task by selecting the very last task. And then with my right mouse click, I will choose insert task option from the drop down list. Then I will select the text editor task to be inserted and then click OK. I will rename this text editor task. The new name of the task would be temperature load combinations. If you do not remember, the renaming of a task could be executed with the right mouse button and the rename option. If we double click on the newly created task task, then the Teddy editor will be open for us for text input. I have prepared and inserted the input into the task. You can find it in the corresponding model or you can simply pause the video and type in the lines one by one if you want to. Anyways, I'm going to go through the input and explain what I just did. So the input was done in module SOFI load. After the heading, I have inserted a multi-line text. You might remember at the explanation of the CADIMP language, I have explained that between the text and the slash text, you can create any type of multi-line text, which will be added to the output, so basically to the report browser file. Normally, in this multi-line text, we add some explanation for the reviewer in the report browser. Here I also did the same. I mentioned what type of method that I'm going to use and how we are going to create this. 
Actually, I wrote a summary, a brief summary about chapter 6.1.5 to explain how the load should be combined together. Then after the multi-line text input, I have created new load cases, starting from load case 91 and goes until load case 98. All of these load cases are created as new and I assign them to action T, which was set up for the temperature action. I also always added a title to the newly created load cases, just to understand what the combination contains. For example, load case 91 contains the effects of the uniform positive uh, temperature change and the linear temperature change multiplied with the omega m factor. And the way how we can really achieve this is to copy in the corresponding single temperature load cases into this newly created load case. To copy in new load cases into a load case, you need to use the command copy. You just simply need to refer to the number of the load case you would like to copy in, and then also apply the factor if it's applicable. In this case, for example, I'm copying in load case 81 with a factor of 1.0, which is the default value of the factor, and that's why it is not given. And I'm also copying in load case 83 with a factor of 0.75. Since its factor is different from the default 1.0, then I need to type out the real value or the exact value of the factor. In a similar manner, I have set up all the eight load cases for all the possible combination of the single temperature load cases. A better overview of the newly created load cases and the copied load cases can be achieved if we arrange the command lines in a special way by using the semicolon symbol. Let me demonstrate it to you. In the CADIMP language you have the possibility to start a new command in a new line but you also have the possibility to add a new command if you have a semicolon in between two commands. Basically, this is what I just did. I rearranged the command lines. And as you can see, first I start with the load case 91 command, and then I add a semicolon, and then I can continue with another command, for example, in this case, the copy command. And then again, I apply a semicolon and continue with a new command. This newly organized view can help you better understand the used factors and load cases. Because now you can better view that the load cases 81 and 82, which were originally set up for the uniform temperature change, were multiplied with a factor 1 and combined together with the linear temperature changed factorized by 0.75. And similarly, you can see that the linear temperature change load cases were factorized with 1.0 and summarized with the uniform temperature change load cases factorized by 0.35. As now, we just need to execute this task to really create the new load cases and store them in the database. With the right click on the temperature load combination, you simply need to select the calculate temperature load combination. And then module SOFI load has performed without any warnings or errors. And that concludes this chapter of the combination of the temperature loads. In the next chapter, I'm going to show you how to analyze the single load cases with the help of the linear analysis graphical user task.